shape and needs our prayers so don't get to be praying for him uh, we'll do that again we'll pray before we go uh, but she'd ask especially that we'd pray for him tonight also all right let's get in the bible now ephesians chapter number two uh, last week we just got in the glory and uh, le- and didn't finish i planned on it but i do plan on that tonight we'll we'll get right into uh, ephesians chapter two finish it up and start on chapter three tonight lord willing all righty um, Ephesians chapter number two, and um, I ask all of you to try to re- memorize verse eight. Ephesians two eight. Everybody in here should memorize that verse. That is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And go ahead and get the next one. Not of work, lest any man should boast. That's one of the greatest statements in the Bible that you can do nothing. To earn salvation, deserve salvation, merit salvation, but we are, it is completely a gift. If I give you a gift tonight, no strings attached, that's what that is. Now, you're not off the hook. Some people stop right there and say, oh, well, give God it. Well, it doesn't really don't matter what we do. The next verse says, you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That means you're not a you're not much of a Christian if you're not doing good works. I didn't say you you wasn't going to heaven. I'm saying you're a sorry example for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Bible said we're created unto good works. I have God ordained which walk with Him. We went in through all that last week. Last week we taught a good little bit on verse 11 on circumcision and uh, the purpose of that. The Old Testament literal circumcision where they uh, cut those little uh, Hebrew baby boys. Uh, that was for, there's, there was a lot of reasons for that. God, it was a sign between God and Israel. The Gentiles didn't do it. They did it for uh, uh, spiritual and also cleanliness as far as uh, germs and disease and stuff like that. And that was the purpose of it. Now, when you get to the New Testament, when you get saved, the Bible says we are spiritually circumcised. That means we're cut loose. Our spirit, our soul is cut loose from our body. Now, in other words... In the Old Testament, most of the time, soul and body are spoken of synonymously. They're stuck. In the New Testament, we have spiritual circumcision. So when you get saved, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, cuts you loose, and they, we, we're saved and going to heaven, and we have to drag this dead body around with us everywhere we go. We're to reckon our flesh dead. And went through all that stuff, you have absolutely no right at all to do what you want to do. I don't either. People say, well, that's my life. I can do what I want. Now, if you're a Christian, you can't. You have no right to do what you want to do. Now, if the Lord lets you do something that you like, great, wonderful. And he does. But you have no right to say, I don't care what God says. It's my life. I'm going to do this, this, that. You don't have that right. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit. So what you have to do, you have to make this old flesh do the right places, do the right thing, because it don't like it. Your flesh is going to pull on you. Everybody's does. I, I, I learned a long time ago, when I got saved, I used to see these people and I thought, they are holy. And the longer I pastored and longer I was around people, I I've, I've found out what old Dr. Ruckman used to say is true. Every dog just got enough fleas to remind him he's still a dog. And I don't care how holy, how right you think somebody is, there's fleas somewhere. There's somewhere where the devil tricks and wiggles his way in every now and then, they, might be a bad temper, it might be uh, jealousy, it might be self-centeredness, it might be your ego, it might be lust, it might be pride, it might be the love of money. The, de- the devil, gonna, he'll, he'll, he knows where your weakness is too. And he knows where that weakness is, he'll try to wiggle in there just like a snake. If you don't keep all the doors closed, they'll get in. So that's what we talked about last week. Look at verse 12. Uh, at that time you were without God being aliens. You know you was an alien before you got saved? 
And uh, we have a different meaning for that word now, but technically it meant from another country or it wasn't part of the big family. And from the commonwealth of Israel, we studied that last week, strangers from the covenant of promise having no hope. Before you got saved, you had no hope. And I'm telling you, the world tonight still don't have any hope. Pitiful, pitiful. I watched a little bit of a debate between Dr. Well, I watched a lot of it, really, about hours. I listened to it in my car uh, while, I, while I was driving. And uh, a debate between Dr. Kent Hovind and uh, three professors at colleges who are learned, accomplished professors and evolutionists. And honest to goodness, it's three against one. And he absolutely made them guys look silly. You know why? Because he's got the word of God and the truth. He's got the truth behind him. If you watch that, it's called Three Evolutionists Debate of Creationists by Kent Hovind. It's tremendous, really. I'd recommend everybody watch. I know you, we don't agree with Kent Hovind on everything, but buddy, when he gets on that right there, you can't beat him, stuff like that. He's, he's a genius, absolutely genius. He eats them guys lunch. He tires them it turns them every way but loose. I, I kind of felt sorry for them. The old professor, he'd say, oh, well, uh, where did God come from? And I thought, a 60-year-old man asking something that Frankie can answer. Uh, God did. Uh, they don't even know. They don't even get it. They, they don't even know what they're debating. And he said, uh, Ken Hovind says, y'all come, you believe we come from rocks? No, we don't. We believe evolution. You take them back far enough? You keep going back far enough, you do. They came from a rock. Then where did the rock come from? Where did the Big Bang, where did the energy from the Big Bang come from? Or the little tiny particle? You, it, go, it boils down to you've got to keep going back far enough, far enough, far enough, and everything came from nothing if there's no God. Now, they would, if I said that, they'd say, no, you know, you're oversimplifying it, and they'd go into a big, long thing. Like, Listen, I'm, I'm making it so you can understand it. You've got to go back far enough. If there ain't no God, everything come from nothing. By itself. So uh, he, he, he just tore them all to pieces. So they have no hope. And without God in the world. Their conception of God ain't even right. Uh, they always say, well, prove there is a God. Don't prove, uh, prove there ain't one. Amen? Y'all prove to me there ain't no God. You say there ain't no God, prove it. You know how hard it'd be to prove there ain't no God? You'd have to go everywhere in the universe and outside the universe. And then that would improve because while he was over here, he might have moved over here. You'd have to be everywhere at once and know everything else in other dimensions and that would make you God. <laughs> it's, it's impossible that there not be a God. It is scientifically impossible that there not be a God. You know what that means? There is a God. He's in here tonight and he's looking at you. And he knows exactly what's in your old wicked low down backslid heart too. And you better get it right because he'll deal with you. He'll deal with you. He'll, he'll whoop your britches because he loves you and he's a good father. Now, um, uh, I like that. And verse 14 said, he's our peace. We'll recover all this. Going to have to hurry. He is our peace. He broke down the wall, that partition between Jew and Gentile because all for thousands of years, the Gentile, I mean the Jews, were God's literal chosen earthly people in the flesh. The sons of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes were God's chosen people physically in this world. Still are, by the way. They messed up, but they still are his people. They're going to get them. They're going to get fixed one day. Now, Gentiles were just out. If a Gentile wound up going with a Jew and got some blessings, that was good. But for the most part, God gave the commandments. He gave the oracles. He gave all to the Jew. Well, here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. He dies on the cross and it opens up the tires down the wall, take the commandments and ordinances. Remember we studied that? Sabbath day, certain kind of meat, so ordinances, and nailed them to his cross. And now Jews and Gentiles are all a part of the body of Christ, the saved that are individual bodies. So it's, it's like this. The family of God, we're going to talk about in a minute, is God the Father and his estranged wife is Israel, but he sought out a bride for his son. That would be the church. So in Anybody who's saved, Jew or Gentile, is in the church. If they're not saved, they're either Jew or Gentile still. Anybody who's saved is a part of that body. So here's Jesus, and one day he's going to marry his bride to be the church. Everybody who's saved. Now we'll see that here as we read along. Look at verse 16. 
and he might reconcile both, that's Jew and Gentile, both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the image of God, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them which were not, Jew and Gentile. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. And we've done, that's last week, so I'm hurrying. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Amen. That's a God, Father, uh, uh, estranged wife, God the Son, his wife to be. We're all a part of the house and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, look at, look at verse 18 again. We both have equal access to God. God don't favor. When it comes to salvation, the Lord don't favor Jews over Gentiles. He don't favor men over women. He don't favor young over old, uh, black, white, brown. When it comes to salvation, it's everybody has access to God through the, the cross of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that a blessing? I love that because uh, God's no respecter of persons and uh, people are sometimes people if, if you don't look like them or live in the same so-called neighborhood or live up on a certain financial state, you just they don't want nothing to do with you. But the Lord's not like that. Uh, he, you're red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. And everybody in the world has open access to God through that spirit. And that's, that's the good news. That's what we preach. That's the good news. Glory to God. Uh, we ain't foreigners no more. The Lord brought us in and we're a part of the family. Amen. Don't deserve it. Gentile dogs. That's what we were, we were called back in the Old Testament. And uh, you ever heard anybody say, look what the dogs drug in? Uh, but that's us. That's us. And I, I'm happy to be called that. But you say, you like, you care, you mean people think you're a dog? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm a low down dog. You might not want to admit it, uh, but I admit it. I know I'm a sorry good for nothing. And I, look what the dogs drug in, Brother Danny. <laughs> but I'm glad I got in, buddy, and he cleaned me up. Now I'm a sheep. <laughs> That's right. Hallelujah. I'm a sheep. Bop, 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 bop. And so, uh, hallelujah. Uh, the, 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 the Gentiles were left out, but now we got in, glory to God. He made his uh, son's bride equal. Uh, to that, and, and they didn't like that. Uh, the Jews didn't like that. They still didn't like it during this time. Verse 19. You're no more foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, have God, and are built upon the foundation. You know what the foundation of the church is? The apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, a cornerstone is for a pyramid. You, 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 anybody got a dollar bill? Get, get out a dollar bill, one dollar bill out of your pocket there a minute, and look at on the back and look at that pyramid. And you'll see that chief cornerstone is off. You see it's off and it's got an eye in it. Uh, that chief, that top part of that pyramid is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ not, uh, not being in place. So the pyramid's like this, all but the corner, chief cornerstone. And one day he's going to come back, make it complete. It'll all be complete during that time. And uh, the devils took that triangle and the cornerstone and money and, the, and made wickedness out of it. So uh, uh, that, that's what the devil does. But uh, he, he's the chief cornerstone in whom all the, in verse 21, the whole building is fitly framed together. You know, they still use that terminology. We're going to build a house, get you framing up. You frame it up. You get the two befores, uh, or, you, or you lay them down on, on the concrete or on the, well, and then you, Take sticks, they call it a stick bill. That's what's inside that wall right there. That wall right there, two by fours, framing in here. Isn't it amazing how the Bible, that King James Bible is so up to date. The whole building is framed together. You know, I've, I've been a part of building a lot of buildings. I'm not a builder. That's not one of my, that's not one of my skills. I can drive a nail. I can, I can, I can, I can hit something. I can tear something up. I can cut something with a saw. But as far as building, I, I couldn't build it square. I just, I don't have that ability. I, I guess I could if I worked at it. But now, now these boys, uh, they're, they're doing real good at that. And, and if a man's going to build a building, he's got to get it exactly square. 
and lay it out. And each one of those little two by fours in the right place, they're on the 16 inch center, what, what they call it. Uh, some are 24 inch center, but a 16 inch center, I guess, is normal, right, Bill? Right? Is that right, Jeff? That's what I've always heard. 16 inch center, and you and you put that is off. And, and sometimes you just feel like, boy, if I'm just one of them little two befores in the wall of God's house, what an honor to be a part of it. Amen. Might be a ceiling tile. Might be oak, oak wood like this right here. And uh, uh, who knows? But all God's people together make that building fitly framed together. I've heard it preached like this: a brick. You're one little brick, and all of the brick uh, of the wall. And God uses individual bricks, just like Mason, to build a wall. And we're one of them. We're stones cut out, you know, that, and fitly framed together in a wall. We ought to be honored tonight that we are get to be a part of God's building. Um, now look, in verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together. Not by yourself, not get mad and stay home and have church by yourself. Be a part of a church, build together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen? God inhabits the church through the Spirit. What did Jesus say? Two or three gather together in my name. I'm right there in the midst of them. You know, these people say, I can worship God just as good at home. No, you can't. No, you can't. Now, if, if you're able or you don't have a way to church, you can still worship God. You can't tell me any of us to stay home and worship God like we can when we're here together. There's just something special about it. I think it's more supernatural than we even realize. I think when we get to heaven, the Lord's going to let us see what I was going on. And when a man gets up here and starts preaching, like Sunday morning, I I had heard a little a little bad news. I, I, you know, I get disappointed every week just about. And somebody sort of hurt my feelings a little bit. And, and uh, 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 I was disappointed. And, and then... Uh, we got a choir started singing. And as soon as the choir started singing, it's just like everything got all right. And the glory came in my soul. I was ready to shout. That's hard to, that's God in the habitation of his house. That's the Lord. It's not, it's it's not always like that, and it ain't like that everywhere. But you can tell, can't y'all just tell sometimes when there's it's like it gets foggy or something? Somebody else is here besides us. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Boy, wouldn't it make a difference if every time we come to church, we realize the Lord's here. The Lord's here. If, if the Lord came and sat down in that chair right there during the service, would you act like you act? Would you sit there and look at your phone? No, sir, you wouldn't. You'd pay attention to every word it's said. You'd, you'd get into it. You would. But guess what? You can't see him, but he's here. You can't see him, but he's here. So... Uh, Let's move along here. We'll try to hurry. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, I, Paul, said this, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Think about that. Paul willingly let himself become a prisoner of Jesus. That's a good man. It's a great man. He allowed himself to be a prisoner for Jesus. He didn't have to. He just got through saying you saved by grace through faith. But he said, for other Gentiles to get saved, I'm going to let myself be a prisoner of the Lord. Lord, I ain't going to do nothing unless you want me to. I ain't going to go nowhere you don't want me to. I ain't going to say nothing you don't want me to. I ain't going to listen to nothing you don't want me to. I'm a prisoner of love, like the old song said. He had just got through saying, you're saved by grace. I ain't got nothing to do with salvation. But he said, for other Gentiles to get saved, I'll become a prisoner of love. And all these evangelists down through the years, that's what they do. Uh, a lot of them uh, is give their self to be just just for the work of the Lord. Give your life to the work of the Lord. And everybody should do that. You say, well, I'm just a housewife preacher. I can't. You can still be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Spend your time, instead of watching The View, spend it in the Word of God praying for all the young people. Uh, uh, instead of just blow it, wasting your time, stuff that ain't even... Uh, uh, Ethan the other day came to me and they said... Uh, uh, Brother Danny, they, they keep coming across these famous verses, and I hear preachers, they come to me and ask me. They said, uh, what does weights, what's a weight? And I knew exactly what he's talking about. He wasn't talking about weights. He lived his, lay, let us lay aside the, the weights, and the sin was just so easily beset us. And uh, I give them the standard answer preachers give, that sometimes things can be a weight in our life, maybe not scripturally sinful, 
but weighs us down. And there's sometimes you better off just get rid of some things, even though it's not wrong, scripturally, so you can do more and be more effective for the Lord. And uh, he said, he said he heard one preacher say that that was laziness. As he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. He said that sin that easily besets us is laziness. I don't know, I don't know where I got that. I, I, I've always, I've, I've read it for 45 years and more, and I've always took it to mean let us lay aside everything we don't really have to have, live for the Lord, and the sin, whatever that sin might be, that easily besets us. Might be different for individuals. So, uh, 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 so might be whatever your sin is. You might have it hid, but you know what it is. And, and the Lord deals with you about it. And so, he said, I'm a prisoner for you Gentiles. If you have heard, if you have heard, of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. Tremendous verse. Tremendous verse. Here we run into that word dispensation again. Let me say again. A dispensation is a certain period of time in which God deals with certain people in a certain way. And it's a period of time where God, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that was a dispensation. Uh, before the law, that under conscience, that was dispensation. When Moses came, gave the law, that was a dispensation. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross, and right now we are in the age of the grace of God, right now, which we'd call the church age. So that's what a dispensation is. And look what Paul said. He said, he said, you, if you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, God dispensed it to, to Paul, like a dispenser, soap dispenser, or water dispenser. Of grace of God, which is given to me to you. How that, now here's here's something very interesting everybody needs to learn. How that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. Ain't that something? God made a mystery known to the apostle Paul by revelation. That means he didn't, it wasn't in the Old Testament. They didn't know about it. It was hid. And Paul went up there in the desert in Arabia, wherever it was all them years, and God gave it to him by revelation. So he come back and started preaching it to the, the churches, and, the, and they didn't like it. They didn't like it. They said, you're crazy. He said, I'm telling you, God gave me this. He said, God gave it to me in a mystery. A mystery, you, you, you know what a mystery is, something uh, uh, maybe hard, mysterious, hard to figure out. Uh, 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 intellectually, uh, Hard, hard to understand, but a mystery, as I wrote in a few words. Whereby, when you read verse 4, understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He, le he learns some stuff. Look at verse 5. If you don't believe in dispensation, look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is that mystery, preacher? Verse 6, same sentence. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of in Christ by the gospel. So he said, look, he said, every Jews, all the Jews had God for 4,000 years. Jesus died on the cross. He took all the commandments, nailed them to the cross. They're not, as far as getting to heaven, they don't save you. And I opened up my body. My body was broke. They killed me. I rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit come down over there on the day of Pentecost. I got saved a few chapters later. I went out in the wilderness. God revealed unto me what he's doing. So the body was already there, but God didn't reveal it until Paul got saved. It was already there, but God they, they didn't realize what God had happened. You notice in the first few chapters of Acts, that'll throw you for three loops. You don't read it right. Uh, they, they still thought you had to do certain things and observe Sabbath days and everything. It took a, took a little while for him to get on board with what the Lord was doing. And Paul said, look, he, he showed it to me. He revealed it to me in the desert. And he said, in other ages, it said, uh, I don't want to get on, I'll, I'll get ahead of myself, but look down at uh, look down at verse 9, and then we'll back up again. And to make all men, Jews and Gentiles, see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things 
by Jesus Christ. God did it by Jesus Christ. And he said this. He said, I hid it, and it was hid in God. And nobody didn't know it until now. Now, that's why Clarence Larkin and a lot of those guys drew them charts, and they'd have them Old Testament prophets looking like this, and all they seen was uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord, the judgment, judgment day, hell. They looked right over top of the church. It was hid right in here. And those Old Testament prophets looked right over top of it and saw the end, the tribulation, the millennium, right on into eternity. Then all of a sudden, the Lord, right before that last seven years, right before that last 1,000 years, he pulls out 2,000 years of the age of grace and sticks it in here and deals with Gentiles. That's a mystery. They couldn't, they couldn't get it. They, they still ain't got it. The Jew, they're still blinded as a nation. They're still blind. They can't believe. They look at us and say, who do you people think you are? I tell you what we are. We're, we're dogs. We got drug in. We're dogs. And we're just old Gentiles that got drug in, glory to God. And I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't mind being called a Gentile dog. I'll take it, buddy. I'm going to walk on gold streets one day, live in a beautiful mansion, have a perfect body. Call me whatever you want to. Uh, call, call us crazy. One day you'll call us gone. <laughs> That's right, buddy. Amen. And so uh, he, that's a mystery, brother. That's a mystery. Them old, Isaiah didn't see it. Moses didn't see it. Noah didn't see it. Daniel didn't see it. Uh, uh, Abraham didn't see it. All they saw was God dealing with Jews. And then, bam! I, I can sort of understand how those strong, lettered, law lettered, learned at the feet of Gamaliel and all that. I can sort of understand how that threw them for a loop. What? We don't, you're going to let these Gentiles in and make them equal to us? The Lord said, that's right. Well, how can you do that? My son broke down the middle wall of partition. Amen. He died and opened it up. So whosoever will can get in. I'm telling you, that's the ground, y'all. Amen. Woo! Glory to God. Now let's back up there at verse number six. That the Gentiles, us, should be fellow heirs, get the same body as they get, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Uh, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God unto me, given to me by the effectual working of his power. Now, you think Paul thought he was hot stuff? Look what he said in verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. What an admission from a man of his caliber. What an admission. For a man that knew, grew up, knew the law backwards and forwards, and then had a special revelation given to him by God out in the desert, he said, I'm less than the least of all saints. Now, there's a great lesson in that. Another place, I think in 1 Timothy, he said, I'm chief of sinners. That's what the Apostle Paul said about himself. Huh? God gave you a revelation of the church out there in the desert? And what are you doing that's so wicked, Paul? I, you're perfect as far as I'm concerned. I, good night, I'd love to be as holy as you are. He said, I'm chief of sinners. You know something? I've noticed that down through the years with people. When people got their nose stuck up in the air and they walk in like they're God's gift to the church and everything, sometimes them people, hey, you ain't going to get no answer to prayer like that. God ain't going to, you know when God will help you? When you get down and say, I'm a chief of sinners. Amen. And I mean all of us, starting right here with me, chief of sinners. I like what my pastor used to say. God said, uh, Lord said, there's hope for everybody because he said, if God can save the chief, there's hope for the Indians. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Paul was the chief of sinners, but he said, I'm less than the least. That's putting yourself down there, ain't it? I'm less than the least. Who's the least saint in the world? I'm less than they are. That's a good attitude to have. That's why I think, look, when, when we have preachers here, I give honor to whom honor is due. Brother so and so, we appreciate him loving and all that. But really, the truth is, uh, he's just a blob of sin like everybody else, Amen. trying to do right, pleading the blood, and walking the best he can, really. And so, uh, Paul, um, I'm least, I'm less than least that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. My goodness. That's, that's rich, y'all. That's rich. He said, I. 
am leaving. I'm worse than anybody. But I get to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. <whistles> Think about that. So the riches in Jesus Christ are unsearchable. You can't even fathom them. I, I, I wrote down a, two or three things that the Lord says stuff like that about. In Philippians 1, 4, it said, well, there's peace that passeth, uh, that's past finding out. So we can't even comprehend the peace of God. You ever had the peace of God? Really? Not, there's, there's no way to say that and tell somebody it's like this, it's like that. Uh, uh, I talked to a girl the other day and I said, whoever got you on drugs really messed you up. I don't know who it was. And she named the name. She said, we just done a line of cocaine together. And that's what started. She's 17. Now she's about 40 and about dead. And uh, it's a miracle she's even alive. Uh, but they could describe to you a line of cocaine, whatever it does. Uh, this, you might hallucinate. You might have a, a hangover after you get drunk. You might have. Uh, but you know what? When it comes to peace of God, it's past understanding. It's past, you can't describe it. The Bible said it's uh, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Have you ever been really right with God? And you start saying, the, the Lord just, uh, there ain't no words to say it. That's when you get your tongues right there. Uh, describe it. Uh, it's, uh, it's brother. I, I'm telling you, hallelujah, amen. I'm just kidding, people online, just kidding. Don't be so touchy. Good night. Uh, I'm 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 il making an illustration. Uh, you don't know. I mean, you sometimes you you can't say it. Sometimes, how many times you seen people just sit up here and you just don't? It, you, there's no words in our language to describe what God's doing inside of us. It's unsearchable, joy unspeakable, full of glory. Uh, his greatness and his is infinite. Psalm 145. His ways are past finding out. Job 11 7. Uh, you can't be described with words. 2 Corinthians 9, 15 said, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That means you can't describe it. And Paul said, I get to preach. You ever thought about this? You ever thought about how come we don't never get tired of hearing this? I've been saved since I was 18. And I love hearing the story and the preaching, if it's real and good, just as much now or more. Than I did when I was 19 years old. What well, that's un you can't do that. Can you imagine if there was thousands of people gathered together in Morgan and every week and studied Karl Marx or Charles Darwin? I mean for 50 and 60 years, <laughs> or the Beatles, or any uh the Lakers or the Tar Heels. I mean, after a while you think, okay, I've heard this over and over and over and over and over. But why is it? After all these thousands of years, millions of people gather every week and still say, tell it, son. Tell it again. Tell me that old story again. Say it again. Tell me again. Tell me one more time. Uh, you say, oh, y'all just crazy. Uh, listen, it's unsearchable. It's, it's preached a thousand different ways. I never, I'm always amazed because I used to think when I first started preaching, I thought, now, after I preach it all, then what? Good night. I've been preaching since I was 19. I ain't scratched the surface. I mean, Preachers that can't find speech, speech, need to turn their TV off or their phone or something. Get down and get right with God. You get right with God and get in this book, you'll have more to preach and you can, you can spit out. It, it, I got messages right now, outlined, that I may preach and may not. I just saw them in the scripture and wrote them down. And I got them at home. I don't know if I'll ever even preach them or not. This thing's full, buddy. It's like trying to dip the ocean out with a thimble. You, it can't be done. Unsearchable riches of Christ. Riches of Christ. Um, I'll stop right there, but look at, uh, look at verse number, uh, 10, uh, to the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, my, 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 according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right. Now, next week, we're going to try to finish this up. I'm sure we will. Just a few more verses there. So we move on. I don't want to get bogged down in this. I've seen preachers do that a lot. And, and you don't want to get bogged down too long. We'll keep moving, keep it interesting. So tell you what let's do. Let's bow our heads right now for a little word of prayer for a minute. And I want you to I want to ask you if you'll search your heart and say, Lord, give me that freshness back that I once had where it was unsearchable. I, it was better felt than felt. It, I, I could feel you moving in my heart. 
and I couldn't even describe it to other people. It was so great. And I remember how happy I was at camp. I remember how happy I was at the camp meeting or the youth rally. And Lord, I just let the devil cheat cheat me out of it. Lord, I claim right now, I believe right now, forgive me of all of my sins and put that same joy and power in my life that I that I miss so bad. Oh God, I want to make a new fresh start with you right now. I pray the Holy Ghost will come down, do a great and mighty work in my life and in my heart. Lord, I love you. I pray, God, that you'd help me to be a witness when we go out of here tonight and tomorrow and be a witness for the glory of God. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. You're at liberty to go. Everybody be friendly in the Lord. Fellowship there a little bit. Uh,